Let's open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis 1, recalibrate, recalibrate. We've been on this series for a while and been talking about some powerful things. And today we're going to talk about a specific part that I think is really important. But I I want to go back just quickly just to catch up. Maybe if you're new, what the word recalibrate means. It has three really key words. Hopefully you've got these by now if you've been listening. If you haven't, then I've been doing a horrible job as a teacher. But hopefully you understand that these three words are essential if we're going to recalibrate. Number one, we've got to know what the standard is. What's the standard? What are we measuring by? And uh, then number two, once we know the standard is, we've got to know what the difference is. We've got to locate ourselves. Where am I in relationship with the standard? How far am I off? How bad am I? Or, you know, whatever it is, where, where am I currently? Then number three, we've got to figure out once we know the difference, then we've got to make a big decision. We've got to have the conformity step. In other words, what decisions am I going to make to change where I am? Or am I just going to be satisfied with where I am? Am I, am I just going to stay stuck here? Or am I going to do some tough things, make some tough choices to change? so that where I am starts to match up with the standard. So that's what conformity is about in that third step. So again, we've been recalibrating all kinds of different areas. We start out with our bodies. Uh, prayer and fasting, we talked about this, but I believe recalibrating your body is something we need to do on a regular basis. Take care of yourself. You know, eat right. Have regular exercise. Huge part of our life and make sure we're recalibrating that. Then we talked about our ears, recalibrating our ears. Talk about what are we listening to? We hear a lot of things, but what are we listening to? We don't want to listen to the wrong thing. Are we listening to the voice of the enemy? Are we listening to the voice of the flesh? Are we listening to the voice of God? Talked about that. Then we recalibrated our eyes. Talking about what are we looking at? What are we focusing on? Not, we're going to see, again, a lot of things, but what are we focusing our attention on? And we talked about how the ears and the eyes are the gateways into our hearts. That's how we get things into our hearts, by what we see and what we listen to. So what am I looking at with my eyes that I need to stop looking at that's going to get into my heart? What am I listening to that I need to stop listening to? Then we talked about last week, we talked about our mouths, recalibrating our mouths. How many enjoyed that? <laughs> we recalibrating our mouths. We, we rode the J train. J cubed helped us recalibrate our mouths. We talked about Jesus, Jeremiah, and James and how we recalibrate how we, how we speak, how we use our words. But today, we're going to recalibrate our minds. And I'm going to go two weeks on this because once I got, talk, got thinking about it, really it's its own series in itself. I believe what we're going to recalibrate today is the most important of all of them. Because the eyes and the ears are the gateways into the heart. The mouth, I said, is the gateway out of the heart. But the mind is the gateway for the kingdom of heaven to connect with the kingdom of the earth. It's the gateway for the activity of the kingdom of heaven to operate in my life. Without the renewed mind, I will not experience the kingdom of heaven on the earth. It's the gateway. I'm going to talk about that. See, in church history, there was a time where the mind was so exalted, so focused on, that everybody just pursued knowledge. It was just academia was preferred over experience. And they just wanted to pursue more knowledge. I wanted to know. So theology and, and the study of theology just went high, high. And people preferred to have a better argument than they had a better experience. They were satisfied to have the ability to argue a point than to have a situation where they could actually experience what they believed. So they, they pursued knowledge and forfeited experience. But how many knows to correct an error, sometimes we can create another error? Anybody ever experienced that in your life? Sometimes we can go from one ditch to another ditch. So what happened, sometimes in the charismatic and Pentecostal movement, now the emphasis on the mind and growing and studying began to be de-emphasized so much that they thought the mind was almost irreversibly evil and should be ignored, and it was only about the spirit. But I want you to understand that the mind is a powerful part of our walk with God. Some people have dismissed the soul and said the mind, will, and emotions is all negative. It's only about the spirit. That cannot be true or God wouldn't have given us a soul. The soul is a powerful gateway into operating in the natural realm and the spirit realm. And we're going to talk about that. So we need to understand the power of the soul because God said, be transformed by renewing your mind. He didn't say be transformed by renewing your spirit because your spirit is reborn 
When you get born again, your spirit is perfect, but your mind has to be renewed to a new kingdom truth. And without that renewal, I will not engage that realm. I will only engage this realm. All right, so you understand where I'm at, why we've got to recalibrate our mind. You know, somebody asked me, I believe it was Wednesday, said, Chad, what was, what's the most important thing? I've heard you say you had to unlearn some things as a believer. What's the most important, pers- most important thing that you had to unlearn? What I'm going to teach you today is the most important thing I ever had to unlearn. I had to recalibrate my mind from things that I had been taught to learn how the kingdom of heaven works and how God wants to work in the kingdom of the earth. But now, I say that, preface that, or, or maybe I follow that up with saying, it doesn't mean I've arrived and I know everything. It means I'm learning and processing as I go. So we're going to recalibrate the mind. We're going to do it through three steps. I'm only going to get through one of them today, but three steps. And I made it easy. I gave you three E's. Recalibrate the mind involves the standard. Number one, what's the example? What's our example? Number two, the difference means about what am I experiencing. So there's an example, but how many know sometimes what the example is is not always what we're experiencing? So we're going to talk about what do we do when my experience doesn't match the example. Well, when my experience doesn't match the example, then I go to to step three. Number three, conformity is about the exchange. What am I willing to exchange? What truths Have I believed here that end up being lies? I have to exchange those for the truths of the kingdom of heaven. What do I need to exchange so that my my experience can match what the example is? We're all trying to match his example and what he wants for us, and so we got to figure out where we are. So let's have you found Genesis chapter one? That's a pretty long intro. (laughs) Well, the preamble, the standard. So what's our example? Whenever I talk about this, I like to go back. So this is not going to be new territory for some of you, but it may be for some of you. I like to go back to the original intent of God. Before sin, before anything happened, in the beginning, I like to go back. If I want to find out what is the example, what is God's intent for the earth in relationship with heaven, I've got to go back to the beginning. I can't go to 2018. Things are a little bit jacked up. (laughs) right? i got to go back to the beginning. Before sin... This is what God wanted in the beginning. If it's what God wanted then, that may be what God wants now. Genesis chapter 1, look at verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. First thing we got to recalibrate our mind is that you have to be open to the fact that you are like God. I know it's going to cause some things on the inside of you to go, tilt. But anything that would make you want to reject being like God is not from God. Because God said, you are like me. He didn't say you are him. He didn't say that you're independent of him. He said that you're in his image and in his likeness. So the first thing you got to start recalibrating on your mind is I am like God. That's going to be a tough one to swallow. Because your flesh wants to remind you how you can't be like God because you know you. I'm not like God based on my perfection. I'm I'm like God because he created me in his image and his likeness. What I do with that image and likeness determines whether I'm like him or not in fulfillment. But his intent is for me to be in his image and his likeness. Are you tracking with me? So we got to start recalibrating our mind that that was God's intent for me to look like him and act like him. That's just his idea. I didn't write the Bible. It says, then let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over all the creeping things that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his image and in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Another thing, recalibrate. There is no distinction between male and female in the kingdom of God. In the New Testament, Jesus it says, in Christ there's neither male nor female. There's no superiority of male over female in the kingdom of God. Recalibrate your thinking. Male is not over female. I'm not doing that to get applause of the females. I'm trying to recalibrate some thinking where people have had in their mind that it's God, man, woman. That's not the way it was in the beginning, how God created it. It was God, male and female. Just recalibrate that in your thinking. So he was a male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them. 
being male and female. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So now, what's God's real, original intent? Look what he says. Here's what God told them in the beginning. I broke down these words for you. First thing he says to them is be fruitful. Be fruitful. Now, when it says be fruitful, I got some great tips from one of our English teachers here between services. First thing, she came up to me and said, I'm an English teacher. I said, I'm sorry. I just, <laughs> I'm just going to apologize right out of the gate for anything that I say that offends you because it probably happens on a regular basis. But she was like, no, 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 that's not what I'm talking about. It was very good. What she shared with me is that when it says be something, be fruitful, it's an imperative statement, that it's a command, it's an instruction. So when God said be fruitful, it wasn't a suggestion. It was an empowerment. It was a command, be fruitful. That word fruitful means be productive, to bear fruit. So now you realize that you are a productive person. Not always good productive, but you are productive. God put that in you. So he said, this is something I want you to do. I want you to be someone who produces. I want you to produce fruit, produce, produce uh, activity. Then, then the second word he says is multiply. Multiply, that word means to increase, to enlarge, to become numerous. Don't stay stagnant. So this instruction was, listen, I want you to have an increasing mindset. Why do we want to keep growing and reaching more people for the kingdom of God? Because God put us into, he put in us to increase. He put in you to grow, to expand. He put in you to thrive and not to survive. Survivor's a great show, but you need to be a thriver more than a survivor. You need to be somebody that God put in you to increase. Doesn't make it about you. Doesn't mean it's materialistic or any of that junk. It just means that God has put it in each and every one of us to multiply or to increase in our life. Increase in your love. Increase in your knowledge. Increase in your patience. Increase in every area of your life. There's nothing wrong with increasing. It's just in you. Be fruitful. Multiply. You got increase on the inside of you. This is how God does, does it. This is what he told you. Look at the next thing he said. He says, then fill the earth. That word fill the earth means fill the earth means to be full or to overflow. To be full of to the extent of overflow. Here's what God's instructions were in the beginning. I want you to fill yourself so much that you have excess in your life. He didn't say, I want you to have enough to get by. I want you to fill the earth. Fill the earth means I want you to have overflow. Why do you need to have overflow? For the people around you. You need to have excess in your life. You need to have extra love. Why? Because some people around you don't have enough. You need to have extra overflow of patience. Why? Because people around you don't have enough. You need to have overflow. Overflow. He says, fill yourself. This is why the Bible says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Not to just barely get enough time, I'm barely going to get by. He said, be filled with it. Overflow. You should have an overflow in your life because that spillover is supposed to impact the people around us. Fill the earth. Overflow. That's what he's telling them. Here's the next part. Fill the earth. Then he says, subdue it. Mm. Subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea or essentially over every living thing. So I'm going to put these two words together. When he said, subdue it and have dominion. That word subdue means to tread down, to conquer to bring into subjection. The word dominion means to rule, to dominate, to scrape out. To rule, to dominate, to scrape out, or to conquer or bring into subjection. Now remember, this is in the Garden of Eden, before sin. What was the original intent of heaven, of the kingdom of heaven on the earth? His original intent was to tell, he told Adam and Eve, he said, listen, here's the thing, I want you, I want you to be fruitful, I want you to multiply, I want you to fill the earth, but I want you to subdue, I want you to conquer and have dominion. I want you to drive and scrape out. I want you to drive out everything. So in other words, outside of the limits of the garden, there was an area that did not match the inside of the garden. God's original intent was for Adam and Eve to expand, multiply, increase the garden until the kingdom and culture of heaven that was in the garden spread over the entire earth. That was his intent. Some people have the mindset that Adam and Eve, their, their responsibilities in the garden was just sitting around popping grapes. <laughs> just sitting around with no clothes on and just whatever. <laughs> whatever, yeah. <laughs> Stay with me. 
But here, what we got to realize is that they had a job to do. But come on, come on back. Had a, job, had a job to do. And here's one of the jobs they do. They had to take the resources that God had given them and they were to expand it into all the earth. They were not to sit around and be lazy. They were not just to survive. They were to thrive and grow the Garden of Eden until it was over all the earth. God's initial assignment in the beginning was heaven on earth, on earth as it is in heaven. It's the way it was from the beginning. He said, Adam, I'm going to plant a garden. I'm going to start here, and then I'm going to put you in charge and then here's what you want, where I want you to do. I want you to do what I started, and I want you to partner with me, co-labor with me, and let's just spread this thing over the entire earth. I'm going to work through you. I'm going to give you everything you need, but I want you to take what I give you, heaven, and I want you to bring it here on earth. I want you to spread it around. That was his goal. That was his, his part. Now, if he told them to subdue and have dominion, does that mean that there could have been opposition to God's directive? He wouldn't have told them to subdue and have dominion if there weren't things that were going to work against the agenda of heaven. God had an agenda that he wanted to accomplish, but he told them to subdue and have dominion. In other words, I want you to literally scrape out anything. It's like scraping out a peanut butter jar. You know, some of my kids, whenever they, because I've taught them well how to put peanut butter on their waffles. And so they, sometimes when they're using peanut butter, They'll, they'll throw the jar away, and I'll be, I'll be pulling that thing. Hey, whoa, whoa, there's still some in there. Hey, let's scrape all of that out. What is he saying to us? He said, I put you on earth. I want you to scrape out everything that's not of me. I don't want you to leave anything in your jar. I don't want you to leave anything. This is why God told them, when you go into the promised land, I want you to get rid of all of them, not to let any of them survive. Then we can take that in the physical, bring it over to the spiritual. God doesn't want us to allow anything of the enemy to stay in our life. He said, scrape it all out. Well, everybody has their vices. No, scrape it all out. It doesn't mean I'm going to be perfect, but it means I have a goal is I'm going to get rid of everything that's going to hold me back from serving God. I'm going to get it all <laughs> get it all out of there. That's what he says when he says have dominion. He says scrape them all out. Get rid of anything that's going to oppose my kingdom. So this was the initial plan of God on earth as it is in heaven. Now, how many know Adam ruined the plan? Had a little... Had a little step back, but God always has another plan. He has an ultimate plan. So now let's go over to Genesis 28. i got to move through this a little bit faster than I did in the first service. Genesis 28. I'm going to start reading in verse 10. So God's intent, the example, we're talking about the example, was on earth as it is in heaven. Verse 10, now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set and he took one of the stones of that place, put it on his head and he lay down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed. And behold, a ladder was set up on the earth and its top reached to heaven. Subtle thing that we need to notice. Where was the ladder set up? It was set up on the earth. Where did it reach? To heaven. But the ladder was on the earth reaching up into heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Angels were going up and angels were going down. Why do angels ascend and descend from earth into heaven? They ascend after they've completed an assignment from God. They descend when they have new instructions and they come down to do another thing for God. They're ascending and descending all the time. They're working. They're working for you. They're working in commission with God. You realize we've got angels that, that uh, God's wanting to use to accomplish the things of God. They're working for him. Let me give you a couple of scriptures quickly. I put them in your notes. Hebrews 1.14, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? They're, they're working for us, for, working for those that are inherit salvation. How's that, that? Who is that? That's us. They're ministering spirits, angels ascending and descending. And Psalm 103 says, Bless the Lord, you as angels who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you ministers of his who do his pleasure. Now, angels are not doing what Chad tells them to do. They're not heeding the voice or my the voice of my word. They're heeding the voice of God's word. 
I can't boss angels around. I can't say, angel, come here and do what I want you to do. No, they don't listen to me. The only time they listen to me is when I'm speaking the word of God. When I speak the word of God, they respond to God's word and they work with that. So when I release that, that's what it's talking about, that we need to allow the angels to work with us and minister as God directs them. So now that's, that's what they're happening. They're ascending and descending. So Lord gives him some struct instructions, said, you know, I'm the Lord your God of Abraham. Look down to verse 15. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Verse 16. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place. Everybody say this place. He's in this place and I did not know it. Is it possible for the Lord to be in a place and we not know it? It happens all the time. Happens all the time where one person can be in a service and God, the Spirit of God's on them just totally wrecking their world and the person right next to them acts like nothing's happening at all. They're like, man, it's dry as a bone in here. God's not moving at all. This person over here just weeping uncontrollably, totally shook out of their spirit. They don't know what's happening. God, See, sometimes this is what I'm encouraging you. Don't let your senses try and determine all the time where the presence of God is and where he is not. Sometimes God could be moving and you not even know it. Some places, times God be, this is why we need to be encouraged when we think God's not moving in a situation. Just because you don't see him, you don't hear him, and you don't feel him doesn't mean he's not moving in your life. He is working on your behalf all the time. He is working. He's moving. I may not know it. I may not see it. I may get discouraged. I think nothing's happening. God's not doing anything. Where are you at, God? Maybe you don't do that. Maybe it's just me. But it's just times where I say, God, how come? You're like, why have you left me? Why have you forsaken me? I try to get all scriptural and talk like Jesus. But he has never, ever, ever been young, been old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or a seed begging bread. Just because you don't see him doesn't mean he's not there. So he said, I didn't know it, verse 17. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. The house of God, the original intent of God. This is the house of God, angels ascending and descending. The, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, the gateway of heaven. House of God, gateway of heaven. What was he talking about when he said house of God? He wasn't talking about a church because there was no building. He wasn't talking about a denomination because there were no denominations. When he's talking about a house of God, what is he talking about? This is none other than the house of God. How awesome is this place? Angels ascending and descending, house of God. What is it? What could he possibly be talking about is the house of God. Surely it's got to be the church, the house of God. No, there was no church. What could he be talking about? Great question. The first fulfillment of this prophecy was Jesus. Because Jesus was talking to Nathanael in the book of John, chapter 1, and verse 51, and he was telling Nathanael, you know, I see you under the tree, and, and Nathanael was like, what? You saw me? And he's like, man, you're impressed with that? I said, I'm going to do a whole lot more than that. And he said to Nathanael, he said, listen, he said, uh, most assuredly I say to you, hereafter you shall see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Angels ascending and descending. This, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. Jesus was the first representation of the house of God on the earth. He was the house of God. The presence of God was on the inside of him. He was that house of God. So the angels were descending and ascending and descending on him. Why were they doing that? Because he was the house of God. The, how awesome is this place? So now you say, well, that was Jesus. Okay, well, let's go to the disciples. In John 14, verse 16, I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Now, so Jesus is now the house of God. Now the Holy Spirit comes in Acts chapter 2. Now the disciples and the 120 people in the upper room, they're filled with the Holy Spirit. Now they become the house of God. So maybe it was just for the first century church. Maybe it's just for those believers back then. They were the house of God. You know, God was in them. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it says this, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? What's the example? What's the standard? Why do we need to recalibrate our mind? We need to recalibrate our, our mind to the fact that God from the beginning wanted to dwell in you. You are the house of God. You are the presence of God. 
You are hosting the presence of God. If you are born again, been filled with his spirit, you are the house of God. Are you taking care of your guests? If I was to say, hey, right after church, I'm going to come over to your house. Like right after church. I'm not going to give you 15 minutes to straighten up. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? You're like you, those people come to the door, and they, you, like unexpected, and you're like throwing things in the other room, closing doors, saying don't go in that room, whatever you do. Pick up, pick up, everybody, quick. They're coming over. But we're the house of God. Everywhere we go, he's with us. When you're at home looking on the phone, nobody else is around, he's there. When you're on the computer and you don't think nobody's watching, he's there. When you're, when you're at work, you're the house of God. That's not a negative, it's a positive. But how are we taking care of our host? Do we walk around like we have, the, have God on the inside of us or we walk around like he's two million miles up in the sky? Too many times we live our life like he's off on some far distant land way up there when instead of realizing we're the house of God. We walk around with his presence. Behold, he's with me wherever I go. You're the house of God. Live like it. Believe it. Receive it. It's not prideful. It's not arrogant. Recalibrate your brain. You're not walking around just with a physical body. You're walking around with the presence of God on the inside of you. The Bible says the fullness of the Godhead dwells in you bodily. If the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us, what have we got at our disposal? We're the house of God. We've got to recalibrate our mind, what we can do, what we can experience when the example that we are that. So now if Jesus is our example, Jesus, Jacob's dream was not just about Jesus. It was not just about the disciples, but it was about every born-again believer. Go to Matthew chapter 6. So now what's our example? What's our standard? Let's look at what Jesus said. We saw what God's original intent in Genesis chapter 1 on earth as it is in heaven. Now let's look what Jesus tells us in, in Matthew chapter 6. He's our standard. He's our example. I'm just going to recalibrate our thinking a little bit towards what is our example. What, is, what, are, what should our mind be thinking about? How should we look at the kingdom of God? How should we look at ourselves as Christians, as followers of Jesus? It's not just about coming to a building and being a nice religious person. We've got to recalibrate our thinking. We are sons and daughters of God, made in the image and likeness of God. And if we'll recalibrate our mind, we will begin to experience more supernatural. But the enemy doesn't want us to experience supernatural. He just wants us to be nice, quiet, moral people and live nice, quiet, good lives and go to church. But he doesn't want you to fill the earth and subdue it. He doesn't want you to have dominion in your life. He wants you to survive because he cannot do anything about you getting born again, but he can shut down your mind where you don't get anybody else with you. He wants to take your effectiveness and paralyze the church and make it just about coming and singing songs and listening to sermons and then going on about their week. God said, I've empowered you to have dominion in this world, to fill the earth and subdue it with the influence of the Holy Spirit because you are the house of God. That's what he's put on the inside of us. I believe the reason some people don't engage Christianity because it's boring, because they've never been taught what they can experience. Christianity is a total bore if all I do is come to church, hear, sing some songs and listen to a sermon and go on about my life. That's a terrible existence for a believer. It was mine for years. But once I recalibrated my mind according to the word and I realized that God's desire for my life was on earth as it is in heaven, then now i got to realize i got supernatural power available to me to change circumstances. And man, it's exciting. It's exciting to walk in supernatural. It's exciting to see God move in a situation. But if all we are are moral and good people that go to church and then go on, I can see why nobody wants to serve God in that context. 
But man, go out and lay hands on someone, see them healed, or go out and witness to someone, see the chains break off their life, and see God invade them and wreck them, and they become born again, tears falling down their eyes. I'm changed forever. That's exciting. And this is what God's called us to do. He's not called us to survive. He's called us to thrive. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. He didn't say go into all the world and say, well, come to church. He said, go into Move on. Move on. Because right, i got to get somewhere. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Stay focused, Chad. It says, in this manner, therefore, pray. This is Jesus teaching the disciples how to pray. They ask him, you know, how, do, how should we pray? Here's what he said. Our Father in heaven, hallowed or holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in what is our example? Heaven. What are we comparing our experience? Our experience on the earth should compare to high bar, isn't it? But it's the Bible. This is what Jesus told us to pray. God, your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. Let's start with that. What does it mean your kingdom come? Jesus in Matthew 4 said, he began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven has come near. So when Jesus showed up on the earth, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is now here. I'm here. The Bible says, I don't have time to go into it, but in Galatians chapter 4, that at the fullness of time, Jesus came, born of a woman, born under the law. Why is that important? Because Jesus was called both son of God and son of man. Why is that important? He was son of God because when Jesus showed up and said, the kingdom of heaven is here, that is son of God saying, hey, I just came to show you I brought my kingdom with me. I want you all to know that this is how we roll in heaven. That's what he was saying. I'm the son of God. So Jesus came to be our example on the will and nature of heaven. Man, this is so important. So important. He was son of man because he was born of a woman, born under the law. He was son of man because he is our example. Are you ready for this? This is where it starts to tilt a little bit, but you got to hang with me. you got to recalibrate. He was our example of what a human being Filled with the Holy Spirit in right relationship with the Father, this is how you're supposed to live. So, no, 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 that's Jesus. No, no, no. He was Son of Man. Your Bible says in Philippians chapter 2 that He emptied Himself of all divine privileges, He humbled Himself and became a human being. He even said of himself, I do no mighty works, but the Holy Spirit that is in me, he does it all. Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit when he came up out of the water. When he was water baptized, remember the Holy Spirit came on him like a dove. It wasn't an actual dove. It wasn't like a bird came down. It came on him like a dove, and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. So he was our example of the will and the nature of heaven. This is so important. This is why Jesus, what Jesus did on the earth, needs to be your measuring stick for what the will of God is and the nature of God. If I want to figure out what the heart of God is for a situation, I don't need to look at a human being. I need to look at Jesus. Because Jesus said, I bring you the kingdom of heaven. It's here. Here's the heart of the Father. What's the heart of the Father do? What does he do? He heals all those who are oppressed of the devil. Some people get into a theological problem when they start measuring and defining their theology based on a human being. This is why I can't use Job as my example for the nature of heaven. People want to use the story of Job. Well, that's what God's like. No, no, no. Don't use a human being. You better use Jesus. I'm not, I'm not hating on Job. I'm not saying he's not a nice guy and all that. He's a great guy. But I'm not going to define my theology based on the experience of a human being with God. I'm going to define my theology based on the kingdom of heaven that came from Jesus himself and how he walked around on this earth and what he did and what he didn't do, what he experienced, what he didn't experience. I'm going to use that to determine my theology. Love Job. 
A lot I can learn from Job's situation, but I'm going to be careful to not define all of my theology based on the experience of a human being with God. Jesus said, I am a representative of the nature of heaven. You want to know what the Father's like? What do you tell Philip? Philip said, show me the Father and we'll believe you. Jesus said, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Shut your mouth. I'm not sure that's exactly what he said, but I, I may have added that last part. But you know what I'm saying? <laughs> son of God, son of man, he's our example. Remember when Jesus said, remember when Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is at hand? You know he also sent out the 12 disciples? And he told the 12 disciples, when you go preach, saying to the people, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And what does the kingdom of heaven look like? When he said, go preach, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Here's then, he followed it up with this directive. He said, I want you to go out and I want you to heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons, freely you receive, freely give. What's the kingdom of heaven look like? It looks like you heal the sick. It looks like you cleanse the lepers. You cleanse like you raise the dead. You cast out demons. That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. You want to know what the will of God is, the nature of God is for sickness? It's healing. It's healing. How do I know that? Because that's what Jesus said. I can't go by, I can't build my theology on my experience. This is why we're recalibrating our mind. Because my theology has to be based on the example. Because we'll talk about my experience. And when my experience doesn't match the example, I don't come up with a new theology to match my experience. I, I take my, I'm getting ahead into the conformity step, but this is, this is when, I, when, I, when I realize that my experience is not the example, then the conformity is I gotta make an exchange. I'll either make an exchange or I'll make an excuse. If I'll make an excuse to justify my experience, then I'll never reach the example. Whew. What am I trying to tell you? It wasn't just the 12. He also sent out the 70 in Luke chapter 10. He said, the 70, you go out and you tell them the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If he'll tell the, the disciples, if he'll tell the 70, then he also tells me, Chad, go out and tell them the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You and I were the house of God. We got to recalibrate our thinking of what we're walking around with. I'm not walking around with just Chad's humanity. I don't, that's not all I'm walking around with. I'm walking around with the house of God. I'm walking around with the presence of God. Now I've got to be mindful of that because when I walk into a situation and there's a problem that faces me, a person that I'm in contact with, that I'm not just looking for my resources to help that person, I also have the resources of heaven to help that person. Too many times we shut down our efforts to help a person in a situation because we look at what we have and we say, I can't help you. But Peter and John said, silver and gold have I none. But what I have, I give to you. Resources of heaven. Peter and John didn't have the power to heal. That came from heaven, but they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were the house of God. So now I have the resources of heaven on the inside of me. And such as I have, I give to you. I got to stop. Because I'm done. Because time. But here's what I want us to do. I want to start recalibrating our brain, our mind, because your mind is the gateway to supernatural experience. If we don't renew our mind, we will never believe that we can walk in the power and authority that Jesus died to give us. We will say things like this, well, I could never do that. I can't do that. That's for them spiritual people. I can't. Renew your mind. Just renew your mind. Just recalibrate. Say, you know, wait, whoa, 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 hey, I'm the house of God. That's not prideful and that's not arrogant, but religion will tell you that. You're nothing but a filthy, scumbag, lowly sinner. I was, but I've been saved and I've been born again. And now I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. My righteousness is not of me and my righteousness comes from God. But I'm not going to call myself something God doesn't call me. I'm going to agree with heaven and I'm going to say I'm a son of God. So I, the resources that I have, they're not of me, but they're of him, but they are in me.